Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the February Minnesota ISSA chapter meeting. Uh, we've got a few announcements here, and then we will turn things over to Karina, our first speaker. Uh, first up, I want to take a moment and uh, thank Leanne Villela, uh, who has been our program director for a number of years. Um, she has just gotten too busy with work and, and job and everything, uh, her life, so uh, she is stepping down. And with that, Karen Anderson is uh, stepping up to replace her as her new program coordinator. So I wanted everyone to be aware of that change. We also have several open board positions. Um, it's a whole list of them here. You can certainly take a peek at that. If you're interested in any of these or any other role, please read out, reach out to me, um, Ryan Sather. Uh, my email is right there on the slide. And let's chat and see if there's something that fits your background that you want to help us with. Let's see. Next up, <clears throat> uh, this is our calendar for 2021 at the moment. Um, so we have chapter meetings in June, September, and December. And then we have, uh, besides, to, uh, sorry, today is a chapter meeting. <laughs> uh, we have webinars coming up March, April, July, August, and November. The March one is up and posted, available for you to sign up for. It's going to be sponsored by Kudelski, uh, which will be uh, done as an ice cream social since we can't really do the after hours events we typically do. Trying it something new here, so we'll see if the, how this goes. So go get signed up for that event. Uh, the uh, You'll get, a, I think, two pints of ice cream, and uh, part of that webinar after this, the speaker talk will be uh, the owner of Izzy's Ice Cream will get on and teach you how to make that ice cream uh, drink. And then we also have some local conferences coming up. Uh, Interface is March 11th. That's a free event, so feel free to hop on that one. Um, we'll, if the link's not on our website, we'll get it out there. And then Secure 360, as always, is coming up in May. And I believe I have the right dates for the Cybersecurity Summit and Government IT Symposium, but I'm waiting on final confirmation that those are correct. <laughs> uh, so today's sponsors are Kudelski Security. And uh, Kudelski and the other sponsor here, which is CoFence, um, will, in between the two speakers, they'll give a brief five-minute overview of their uh, company for you. And now with that, our agenda, we're a couple minutes ahead here, but we're going to start with Karina Clever, and um, and then we'll do our sponsor, and Tony Asher will uh, be our second speaker today, and then we'll wrap up. With that, let me turn things over to Karina. All right, Karina, you should be all set there. Yep. So, no, hold on a minute. Um, which screen do you guys see? See your PowerPoint presenter view. Hmm, gosh. Uh, let me pick the right screen, hold on. There you go. All right, great. So do we wait until quarter past or how do we do this? No, you can go ahead. We can just go ahead. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you everyone for uh, for coming. Um, and I hope you're all staying warm because I know there's some cold weather out there. So let's go ahead and start with incident management uh, before we really dive into it. An intro about me is uh, I've been in IT over 30 years now. Um, done a lot of governance programs and compliance efforts, uh, started as a programmer, um, got sick of getting bad specs, so I went into the project management, program management world, um, everything from Fortune 100 companies down to, you know, Joe's Plumbing Shop. So, uh, broad scope as far as the uh, kind of companies I contributed at. The, the one thing I really want to throw out there are the permutations we have out there in our industry, right? So very important, um, tomato, tomato, there are going to be words that I'm going to use in this deck that you may have, um, 
use different words for in your company. Um, you may have a solid methodology that you use, you may not, you may have regulations that you have to abide by, you may not. Uh, but I think what's important is uh, conceptually we have to understand the flow of the work, uh, the policies that affect our work, and incident management uh, really does depend on a lot of influences for it to operate correctly. So. Uh, what we're going to do is hope that you guys get something out of this because um, if it's not called exactly that in your organization, uh, hopefully there will be something soon. The one thing I do want to say is uh, give yourself some grace from a perspective of if you don't have all the policies and processes in place and you can call them more constructions, SOPs, it, it doesn't matter what you call them, um, start somewhere. There, we're going to go through a lot of information right now and just starting somewhere is more important than not doing it at all and being overwhelmed with how much there is to do. So um, I think that um, give yourself kind of the, the goal and the charter to just start on a small level and just start building from there. Policies are never done. Operations are never done. They're forever. And you definitely want to get to where you uh, can continue to grow them and keep them current. All right, so what we're going to be talking about, really this is kind of split into two. In order to make incident management work, we're actually going to start with a lot of other policies. It's going to be short, um, but we need to make sure that all those other things are in place before we get into incident management. So uh, we're going to go ahead and, and, and go through those supportive governance pieces first. Very first one is data classification. You want minimum three levels, and this is purely data, right? So you want to know what's the super important stuff, what's the operational stuff, and what's the noise. We spend a lot of money as an industry storing our data right now. Uh, in 1989, when I started IT, we, the IBM had come out with a one gig server and it was $40,000 in 1984 or six or something. And we were actually using those at Lytton. So at that time we had to make decisions about what's more important, our HR tax stuff or our client data. <laughs> Those are hard decisions to make. So what we wanna do is make sure we carefully assess the data that we have in our daily life and your noise, retention levels, all of that will be different than your super important stuff. So what do you want in your policies? Four things. First one is your super important level, uh, your super important data, you want to encrypt it, right? And so you're going to have a separate work instruction for that encryption. Um, your logical physical access controls are going to be very different between the super important stuff and the noise. Your retention guidelines, very different, and destruction gu guidelines, right? Your noise, maybe you want to keep that, I don't know, for a few weeks, get rid of it. Don't store it, because the bigger your data set is, the more enticing you are to ransomware, to hackers, right? Don't store your noise. Give it a very specific location where you just purge very regularly. Your super important stuff, right? That's your encryption. That's your real time or as close to real time backup for your, your retention, right? All of those things are, you, you need super special permission permissions for that. Don't treat all of your data the same way. You're going to take your data classification. You're going to align it to your line of business and all of your perimeter security, right? So I need to know this data is used by finance. This data is used by HR. This data is used by a critical operations group in my company. So when you do that association and you align it and then you show those controls on the outside, what you're actually doing is you're tying into incident management with these points right here. Because when that incident comes in, those technicians who handle that ticket need to know can they get into it? Am I looking at current data? 
am I being blocked because of encryption? Who's really impacted? And what security is on the outside for that perimeter do I need to look out for? Remember, at the end of the day for data classification, we're actually trying to answer, what do we need to recover and restore first? So your data classification policy will give that guidance to your incident team. Point number two, asset management. So we went through this whole process of identifying where is that critical data? Now, where is it housed, right? So we have to identify, um, is it at a vendor's? We need to know. A vendor's is our biggest gap right now in the industry. Um, you know, th there are a lot of assumptions that are made at a contractual and an MSA level that do not uh, actually bring coherence in between how your data handles your data and how you handle your data, or how you may be handling your vendor's data. Um, we need to know about maintenance. There may be exclusions and requirements for, uh, we're not gonna cover you unless you do these patches, right? Uh, you, the, the incident folks need to know, you know, is this still under warranty if it's broken? Uh, or intelligently use collective information about incidents to make a determination on whether or not you want to pursue a warranty. So um, one of the most important things for asset management, uh, configuration management, depends on what competency you're looking at. Again, that's a tomato, tomato, nomenclature thing, um, is you need to know what staging prod dev, right? So if you're in pharma, uh, pharma, you know, GXP standards say, you will treat your staging environment just like you do production. So your staging is mirrored with production. Other environments will say, it doesn't really exist, we don't really care about it unless it's in production. So, so what you don't wanna do is have a wild goose chase on an environment from an incident team chasing something that doesn't even really matter, right? Maybe it's part of a change record and it's part of some testing that's happening and you know, why are we even opening up an incident? So, so you want to reference in all of these, um, as you do this configuration asset management, scripts, works, and work instructions, knowledge bases, nomenclature again, right? Tomato, tomato. But what you want to do is as you define these assets and as you identify them, you want to create collateral that is referenceable by those technicians when they get that ticket. They need to know what's the what's the warranty number we call. Um, you know what latest patch number am I looking for when I pull up this equipment? Um, and of course, I need to also understand the risks. So your risk management or vendor management it really depends on where you have that. Those inputs are going to be operationalized based on your identification of those assets, and then you can also use that as a gauge to say okay, well, this part's important to me and this one isn't. So, so really what we want to do is we're going to take that data classification, and remember we already did our architecture mapping, our li lines of business association, that perimeter, and we're going to go ahead and identify all of our assets. And these are the things right here, this, these green check boxes that really have a direct impact into incident management. Because remember, we're talking about incident management that configuration management competency comes in and feeds all of that incident management information. And what are we trying to answer here? Where are our golden eggs, right? So when we, when, when I'm a technician and I've got 57 tickets, when I come in and log in in the morning, I need to know what one is the most important. And again, that data classification comes in, that asset management comes in, and asset management hopefully is going to give me instructions on how to readily handle that piece of equipment that has gone down. All right, that's the second one. Our third one is access control. So this is usually a big ask, but please, please, please start somewhere. What you want is a matrix that says, on the far left, here's the roles in our job families that come in from HR. 
And along the top, here's our system and the levels of permissions. When I cross-reference that, I actually will know when I hire that senior project manager, that's a recurring role in my company, and we're going to know out the gate when they're onboarded what exactly they have access to. This is going to be insurmountable for efficiencies because what's happening is when we identify these functions, we now can reference a standard set of permissions for support for all those approvals for your admin functions. Every auditor in the world is going to say, where's your your you know most significant permissions are you doing least privilege permission are you doing segregation of duties canned normal set of controls in your environment so what we want to do is we want to say okay well not only does that senior management have full access to system one but further down the line as the spreadsheet continues they also have access to get into our data center or they also are assigned to do our vendors audits so we want to make sure that not everyone has access to everything. And so I'm going to, I, I'm going to tell a really quick story. Um, got brought in company, a few companies back, they only had like 5,000 people working for them. And um, one guy eons ago set up a uh, sales group, fantastic, very successful sales group. He was working super hard. He brought in a prodigy, trained her. She was amazing. Um, she ended up growing this team, you know, they were one coast, then the other coast, then the middle coasts, and wherever else, and between the coasts. All of a sudden, this group grew to 157 people. Fantastic, very, very successful um, sales group. So uh, one day, a woman comes into my, um, into my office crying and upset. Uh, out of a react, an emotional reactional situation, and I won't go, go into that, one of her coworkers, she went and she confessed to me that she changed the commission amount for last quarter for one of her peers. So there's a whole long story about why she was even compelled to do that out of anger, all of these things. But the fact that she had access to change a peer's commission check from 7,000 something to $7, she just rolled back the, she just deleted some trailing digits. Um, talked about access control, and it turns out that when the first guy brought in his protege, uh, the ticket said, just replicate Mike's access. And then when the protege came in and she started hiring staff, she just said, just replicate my access. Well, before you know it, everyone in the sales team had the same level of access to change commission checks as did the main, main guy with appropriate levels of admission, uh, administrative access. So, um, so please avoid ever saying in a ticket, replicate someone's access, please. A matrix like this will help you. And the other thing that you're gonna do when you mature is you're gonna take this and every single time where it says a yes, that's gonna be a separate ticket. On average, when you do an onboarding, you have 37 touch points between here's a phone, here's a workstation, here's access to this system, access to this system, access to this system, building and Im imaging a workstation. There are an average 37 points that are required to onboard someone. So when the person who images the workstation receives a ticket, they don't care. Is it because somebody dropped their laptop at the airport? Is it because we have a new hire? Is it because somebody is changing permissions, getting a promotion, a demotion? They don't care. They image the workstation. So what's important is to get those tickets into those technic technicians at a level where they can actually do that. And of course, what are we trying to answer here? Uh, what's our main question? Oh, the very top one, right, is our, our one checkbox that's going to directly associate with incident management. The one checkbox we're trying to question we're at, trying to access here is who has access to the golden eggs. So remember. We identified what the golden eggs, we identified where they are, now we need to know who has access to them. All right, next policy. So, um, security policies. This is a fun ball of goodness, right? Um, end user expectations, 
we, we really are trying to understand what does the end user think is okay? Well, at what point does the user pick up the phone and say, um, I clicked on a baby in a, in a puppy picture and there was something wrong and my behave, my, my computer went dark, right? So when we're doing that end user support, we need to understand as a baseline, what do those end users actually know? On the flip side for security policies for IT, we need to make sure that users know what it means to have privileged access, right? Um, what are the documentations that end users have that I have to make decisions? Um, how do I talk with that end user? That's very important. What am I expected to know? What kind of you know, magic wand am I expected to, to actually have in my back pocket? And I also need to know, at what point do I get help? I, I, no one knows everything, we know that, right? So at what point do I go off and say, white flag, somebody make a decision for me? And the, the interesting thing is when policies don't exist, those white flags get waved more and more and more because your decision points will bubble up to a governance level nine out of 10 times. You'll, you'll say, well, what's our position on this? How am I supposed to do that? And that is usually a policy statement. So really, what are we trying to get to at the baseline of this? What is our baseline level of security? right and and how much do those end users know and how, and when do they know to connect us to connect with us and get a hold of us for help all right we only have two more policies left right and um this one's really really important change management change management um love change management if done right if calculated if we follow our schedule if we follow our approvals if we have that full view for our impacts. Impacts are very important. Again, all the way back, data classification, asset management, where is it? Those are our lines of business impacts. We have to consider those when we approve change management. But what does change management unfortunately do some of the time? It goes and creates a ton of incidents, <laughs> right? If we didn't check those impacts, if we, if we didn't know really what are we releasing and validate that it got released correctly. So, so things that are really, really important here is documentation of that change. There should be a workaround and there should always be updated instructions, right? And as part of your post implementation review and your change management, there needs to be collateral that's an output of that change management cycle that basically says, dear technicians and in incident management, here are your work instructions. Please go execute according to these because we want to make sure that those work instructions are providing enough information for those technicians to handle the incidents that maybe, hopefully not, but if they do, they'll come out of that change management space. So very, very important. This last one is the most important out of change management for an incident management perspective, right? The next one really that's important is, um, well, and that's our question. Do we have enough attention on the changes that we deploy? And so likewise, the other issue here, the other last competency here is problem management. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna default to some ITIL terminology here, but it, it's really been proven to be uh, the case. If you have more than one like incident, it's a problem. Um, know when you have to raise that flag and problems will be will involve different participants. It depends on the problem that's happening and the actual problem that you're trying to solution for. All right, those are our critical policies that feed into incident management at the level that they feed into incident management. It's not an all-inclusive list, but if you have these, and you have that workflow, that full cycle of these core competency areas feeding into incident management, you're going to be in way better shape to execute on incident management successfully. All right, now let's actually talk about incident management itself. So we're going to consider moving forward that all these things are in place. Now, we're going to talk about the number one incident management rule out there. 
there's a broken and there's a need. There's no other highlights in this entire presentation. If you remember nothing else out of today's session, please remember that incidents should only be opened when something is broken. This goes against very many of our ticketing systems that are out there. I'm completely tool agnostic. I've worked with a bunch of different tools, but please, please try to figure out a way how to separate out incidents and requests. The reason is, is because when you have a request that you're handling as an incident, your incident metrics are watered down, throw them out the window. They just won't work anymore. So some examples, let's talk through this. An incident is legitimately something is broken. My laptop went dark. Um, I clicked on that cute baby puppy link and now there's this thing that says enter your password in here. It looks like our portal. Uh, should I? Um, I got a call from our vendor. They got hacked. Um, there's this really weird error message. Um, we're getting calls from the finance group and we had a release last night. They're dark. <laughs> they are not up. When it's broken, it's genuinely an incident. Here's when it's not an incident. Um, upgrade my smartphone. Um, you know, I'm going to need that big conference room or I need the big projector in two weeks. I, I'm, I'm being really careful and I'm trying to prepare the right way. I want to make sure all of my stuff is in alignment. Uh, please, um, you know, make sure to get me the projector in time. Um, we have a promotion, we have a demotion, or I don't know how to use something that's actually uh, in my suite of tools. Um, so, so this one thing, this change, this fundamental principle between incident and request is very, very important. Um, something is chatting. Oh yes, okay. Sorry, I got distracted. Okay, super. So uh, if you don't remember anything else, please remember this and try to make a few efforts in-house to, to separate those two out. I'm gonna belabor this because this is a huge problem in a lot of different companies. All right, now let's get to the actual policy itself for incident management. So the policy provides for the governance there will be other documents. There are processes, procedures, uh, SOPs, work instructions, tomato, tomato, right? The policy of incident management will provide you uh, operating principles, basically, for how those operations are executed. So what does this mean? This means um, I will have statements in there that say, for instance, um, if it's a highly classified piece of data or piece of equipment, you're going to go to that department or classify it a certain way or pri uh, prioritize it a cer certain way. Or when you have two incidents and let's say they got open at the same time, the ones over here are more significant because they may be associated to a, uh, a certain type of data classification or maybe a vendor or maybe a line of business that's important to us. The second thing is what is an imminent failure? Uh, pretty important. Imminent failure, I need to know, right, you have warning signs, you have characteristics in your environment, you have a cue maybe that you're looking at that is saying to you, um, you know, there are some patterns that are happening in the failures that we're experiencing or the tickets that we're getting. When do I know, uh, how do I get in front of that, right? What are my criteria to get in front of that? Of course, there's the correlation to the other competencies, right? And we talked through all of those before that. Um, incident management, incident, uh, ma I'm sorry, major incident, we actually misuse many times. A uh, major incident is really when you want to open up that um, bridge line, uh, maybe now it's Zoom, 
uh, and you have an incident commander and you call the attorney and you call the communications group and you call HR and, and maybe there's a breach, maybe there's something that has majorly taken you guys out. Uh, many times people jump from incident management straight into problem management um, to open up that bridge line and to have that incident commander be engaged day or night, people calling in and checking to see what's going on. Uh, I think with a lot of our off-prem environments these days, many of these days may be gone. However, um, you should mention in your policy that if there is an imminent failure, if there if there is something critical enough based on that classification or configuration management um, and or configuration management, you wanna you wanna have a method and an out for everyone to talk instantly. Uh, trigger methods, we're going to talk about what does that mean to open up a ticket. Uh, then, of course, there's uh, engagement standards, and then how do we grow incident management, right? So, of course, there's going to be measurements involved, there's going to be thresholds involved, but we want to grow incident management as the competency. We just want to get better and better and better at it. Of course, the question that we are trying to answer here is, where does this fit in your overall ecosystem? And um, how important is it, right? Is it your one-stop shop uh, kind of solve everything for end users or are you running projects out of incident management? Um, are you trying to have incident management also be your re your release or your change management uh, competency, right? You wanna, you, you wanna kind of understand the scope of incident management in your organization based on that policy positioning. All right, let's talk about opening uh, an incident. So it, it's a little busy. There's a bunch of different scenarios um, on what where an incident opens. And again, remember, this is broken. This is not that request that's back there, right? We're, we've now dropped requests from our vernacular. This is genuinely a break. This is not somebody's being onboarded in two and a half weeks because they accepted an offer letter. This is genuinely something has broken. So um, the other thing that you want to consider is all of your systems talking to each other called event management. Potentially, if you establish a threshold in those systems, they could also send you tickets into event man into incident management. So um, the end users themselves are really not that big of a of a scope of work for your incident management team. Yes, there are definite failures. You know, you want to grow up into having knowledge base articles for your end users, uh, for those end users who have kind of self-help capabilities or, or they have insomnia at 2.30 in the morning and they're in their jamamas and help desk isn't open, right? You want to equip them with collateral where they can follow tutorials, they can follow screenshots with arrows and, and help themselves. So you wanna to mature to that from the end user perspective. The only way you get there is if you actually have those knowledge base articles established. And when you do your that, when you do your incident management maturity and you say, when I have, as I review last month, and I see that I have out of um, kind of 25 unclassified types of tickets, 12 of them were the same exact thing. And these are, this is a great self-help opportunity for our end users. Do a video for that. Do a video for that and post it. You just eliminated your ticket count, right? You've just gone down into enabling your end users to self-help. Not all end users are gonna wanna help themselves, but the ones that do, you're giving them that opportunity. Many major companies are actually hiding help desk phone numbers all together these days. So uh, because they're building up that collateral uh, and and there may be a lot of rolling eyeballs. I, you know, I tell this to clients and they say, oh, no, our, you know, our end users want the hand holding and the white glove and the, they think they're special. And that's all true. That's great. But you're also accountable to train them and have them know where they can help themselves. Same, same end user opens the same ticket on the fourth time. 
um, you know, start sending them the link to the knowledge base article that says, please go read about this all yourself because you're going to do this two times, you're not even going to need to call us anymore. So, so event management is one piece, right, where systems are telling other systems there's something wrong, I need you to pay attention to me. Events could come from vendors. You could also have your end users coming in. Um, you also need to know, am I handling a ticket that is as a result of a project or a change record any differently than from an end user or an event? Um, you know, the, also people will elevate priorities if somebody really important says to them, I need you to do this right now. All of a sudden, you know, you're five, you're low, priority five, lowest priority, what may, you know, or C or F or whatever letter you give it, again, tomato, tomato, your lowest priority ticket all of a sudden becomes super important. Is it really super important just because that got prioritized based on someone uh, in authority. So a lot of things to think about when you're writing that incident management policy as far as quantifying how does an incident start, right? So remember in the prior slide we defined what is an incident and now we're defining what is an acceptable start for an incident. And once you really look at that, that's going to actually help you a lot with figuring out from there now let's take uh, the procedures and then let's quantify how do we mature this how do we get better and better at this right so one of the most important things um, in starting that incident is priority now any of you that know ITIL know this graph right um, tried and true systems are built on it uh, there's this concept called urgency and impact uh, the combination of the two gives you the priority right many times Priority five tickets, which is the lowest bottom right, are used to just track notes on, hey, I made an update on this version for this, or this vendor pushed this thing, or this vendor called us and said, you know, hey, we're going to take you guys down in two weeks. Please do the following backups, What you know, whatever is the case, work notes, and then one is kind of the, the earth is falling apart. And of course we know that your priority will calculate and help calculate your SLAs for that ticket, your sequencing queue. Uh, some queues are built to actually have the highest priority tickets go in the very top so they're seen first. Um, or, the, or the timing of where they're transferred from one queue to the next are actually condensed based on higher priority. So, uh, a four, a priority four ticket could sit in a queue for four hours, six hours before it even gets um, a notification sent. But a priority one will have a notification sent in 15 minutes to everyone and their cousin and their cousin's dogs and cats, right? So really different uh, level of engagement for the for different types of tickets. So the one thing that I found, and it's pretty pretty characteristic of most companies is that thing called urgency and that thing called impact um, is a most people just don't know what to select and I recommend dropping high medium and low so just a quick example um, one of one uh, company I had worked with we kind of decided to replace impact and urgency uh, to this selectable form for the end user, right? Um, I'm opening up a ticket because it's company-wide. Um, there are more people than just me affected by this, or it's just me, right? Um, or I have a critical work stoppage, meaning, oh no, I have a presentation that I'm giving in three minutes and it's not working, help, I'm screaming. Um, you know, Things aren't behaving as they should, but mm, I'm kind of scratching by. I do need help though. Or you know what? I I just it's a button thing. How do I change this color from blue to green? Not you know not not a lot of um, end of the world things. It just is broken. It's not behaving the way it's supposed to. 
The problem with high, medium, low is people get in their head, especially end users. And I have heard everything from, wow, the IT guys are so super busy. I'm not the most important thing in the world. So I'm going to go ahead and hit low. Or you have the very, very um, self-declared important person saying, I'm the most important thing in this world because I'm so important. Uh, you know, they will declare something high and it's really something completely minuscule compared to really what the rest of the queue looks like. So what's important here is to allow end users to select something that they relate to. Some companies will, will instead of these types of impacts and urgencies, say there's a financial uh, buffer, right? Um, you know, or there's a, um, the, you know, there's a, system related you know this is this is related to a whole system whatever works for your organization is really how you should define that and this is one of the key starting points and how that incident really flows downstream all right next um the other things that we're going to look at when that tickets get created in addition to that into in addition to the prioritization that we just went through uh, that asset, right, configuration management, is this a golden egg asset from a perspective of equipment or data? Uh, is the data super, super important, right? Um, what is my handling for VIPs? Remember that super important person, maybe we're not going to make that a highest priority incident, but we're going to bump them up to the top of the line because they are a VIP, right? Um, do I have someone on my team who's in a habit of sitting down and looking to see what launched last night? Because many, many times your clues to determine whether or not your incidents that are coming in this morning have anything to do with the change that got released last night, really surefire way to roll back changes and kind of build, uh, build a, a project together or a, a problem record together to determine really what needs to happen moving forward. You can also take this and communicate out to your end users and say, hey, end user, I know that uh, you're experiencing this problem and we know about it. Don't open any more tickets. We're on it, you know, ETA 2 p.m., whatever it is. Um, there, there is one thing that people do, they, they say, especially when talking about system to system uh, tickets. So when you have that system that has a threshold and the threshold has been met and it creates a ticket into your queue, many people will say, oh, well, only one guy knows how to deal with that queue and he's a level three. So I'm going to go ahead and have everything go to that one guy in level three. And you have to remember your conference room concept, right? So your conference room will always be there in your building. It's a permanent fixture. There's a table and chairs and a monitor. Maybe there's nothing. Maybe you guys do whatever in the conference room, right? Just sit on the floor, maybe on pillows. It doesn't matter. The conference room is a part of the architecture of the building. People go in and out of that conference room, right? People reserve that conference room for blocks of time. When you have a ticket get created, never, ever, ever assign the ticket to one human. Assign it to the conference room because people actually bump in and out of that queue. So when you hard code assignments to a direct human, you know, Karina may be in this group today, but tomorrow she may be in a different group. She's not going to take the tickets that are assigned to her. She needs to train somebody to in that remaining group how to handle those tickets there need to be knowledge articles and work instructions that provide information on how to continue to grow that particular queue so what's very important is never auto assign anything to a direct assignee because what if they're on vacation what if they're what if your timing triggers aren't working what if you get a ticket into a queue and it's assigned to one person who's on vacation and, and then there's never an escalation or you build some sort of a, hey, this has been in your queue 72 hours now, directly assigned to you, you've ignored it, I'm gonna forward it over to your boss, right? Do the workarounds that way. 
All right. Um, there's going to be some basic policy verbiage, obviously, in your incident management. Um, and this is kind of auditing stuff that auditors like to see. Every single ticket has a unique ID. Uh, you know, all tickets are logged. We have an audit trail. Uh, there are review cycles where we review the actual policy itself to make sure that we're monitoring it correctly and measuring it correctly and it's continuing to grow. Um, we have an incident. Okay, we're going to go through a happy path assumption real quick here. Um, so, so our assumptions are tickets come into the right queue, the positioning is correct, it's correctly prioritized, it's assigned correctly, um, there's an associated competency record that's referenced, if that's the case, but um, I do want to point out one thing that I've seen chronically, chronically wrong in a lot of organizations, uh, something I, I call double notification. Now, we have a lot of our ticketing systems forcing an email into our queue. And what happens is that one technician gets the same work notification from two mechanisms. We're breeding ADHD. Because what's happening is it's the same one piece of work, but depending on what monitor that technician is sitting on, they're getting that same one piece of work coming at them from two different directions. It's really, really important to decide where is your master? <laughs> where is your source of truth? I actually have gotten companies to where they turn off the email notifications. They allow the email notifications to end users, but not to their technicians. Because what happens is you're allowing an interaction with a ticket to happen based on what you're more comfortable with. All of us know email. All of us love email. All of us are used to email. Sure, it's easy for me to reply back to an email and think and hope that somewhere on the back end that email updates the ticket, right? But then there are other people who work in the actual queue who are looking at that queue as their single source of truth. So I implore you because it, it, there's a lot of efficiency gain and it may not seem like it in the beginning, but get, but get past that initial uh, forcing a new habit when you actually decouple email from telling you that you have work in your queue, work off the queue. Work off the queue because then you can actually define scripts on how to update that ticket and everything is centralized in there and you know that you have hands-on present interaction with that ticket instead of scrolling through and, and, and looking maybe at an email that someone sent. Just a just a kind of hint out there. I've I've seen people lose hours and hours and hours on this. Work instructions again. Uh, so right, we're going down this happy path. Um, the technician has information in their hand that says I know how to re relieve this or re resolve this issue. Um, they take meticulous notes, and they're actually also referencing known errors, workarounds, change records, project updates, whatever they're referencing. All right. Let's go down a work work uh, kind of a workflow here. So, entry point, end users, technicians, maybe who take a call from the end users, right? Or maybe they find something themselves that's wrong. Maybe they get an email from somewhere. Um, our internal systems can send flags. External systems can send can send flags. Vendors could potentially send flags. There's something else happening. Either which way, any of these plus probably some I haven't captured here, create this incident, right? So this incident arrives, lands into level one. I'm gonna talk about level one for one second. Level one in ITIL terms is considered triage. It's actually technically a level zero. Level one, um, most people don't use a level zero, so I'm kind of putting in level one here because it, it's, it's kind of the most intuitive de definition. There's a few things we definitely want to look for in this level one column. It should have the highest resolution rate. Um, there are going to be KBAs that are created or referenced on the spot. Because remember, you want to take that KBA one, you, you want to splash it back over to the end users for their reference eventually, right, as you start getting good at this. 
There's meticulous in check it notes. You have those configuration items associated uh, for, for your assets, right? And then you have your SLAs that are in place. So ideally, this section right here, there's like a hard line ideally here at the end of this, and that's the end, right? That's the perfect world for what we want that, that incident process to look like. Second, let's say we can't fix it. We transfer the incident into a functional queue. Number one rule is do not recreate the work in level two that you did in level one. This is where those notes come in. If you have that level two technician spending the next three hours that the level one technician spent three hours to try to figure out what's happening, you're, you're defeating the purpose. The level two guy makes a lot more money than the level one guy. There are actually also more level one, level two guys than there are level one guys. There's usually only one level one. So basically what we wanna do is not replicate that work and continue to write those meticulous notes, right? Um, you, your, your SLAs are gonna tell you, when do you pull someone in? What, you know, when are, when are we uh, moving forward with that? I think I'm running out of time. Am I running out of time? Okay. I'll go fast. Incident has escalated. Now, uh, level three is really tough, right? Because um, when something lands into a level three queue, that's your specialist, the SLAs will perpetually be stuck on hold. Try to not do that or try to build some mechanical workarounds for that on hold status to not be there an overused amount of time. And then the last thing is it could move off to another competency, right? We've got change management, problem management, maybe even major incident management. Maybe it's going to go off into another group. Okay. Uh, so that's basically the flow of work. And of course, the knowledge hops back over across to that incident, to the end user uh, for self-help. All right. So transferring between levels, never, ever replicate work from the other side always write those notes. Escalations, define them really carefully and specify in there under what condition does uh, escalation get constituted, right? You don't, you, you don't wanna just blanketly escalate. Um, sometimes it's okay to skip steps in certain situations, but track those. Again, that's gonna roll up into your incident management policy that you can then sit back at the end of the year or once a quarter when you review that policy and say, hmm, we had a lot of this kind of exception. I guess we didn't know that was happening in our environment. We should be really, really careful with making sure that we accommodate our policy for these exceptions, and then that'll make it easier for everyone. All right, leaving incident management. Um, so I'm gonna kind of, go through these a little bit. These are the competencies that are more likely you're going to move into, move your ticket into, uh, right? That incident management, problem management, if there's more than two incidents that are similar, and then of course, change management. Change management and incident management can many, many times loop forever because an incident can, can cause changes and changes can cause incidents. All right, closing slide. Uh, I, I'm actually going to probably make it on time. All right. It says we're done here at the top right, but the reality is we're never, ever done. Um, so here's the thing to remember. Mechanical things break. They, I mean, cars, bikes, refrigerators, desks, printers, mechanical things break. Uh, you know, they either break way further down if you take good care of it, or they break as soon as you get them, you go return them. Um, it's just part of our operations and part of what we do in incident management. It's We just have to be prepared to account for the operations of incident management forever. And, and, and our challenge is to anticipate those breaks, right? So what we have to get really good at is to say, I know you're going to break, but I'm anticipating you breaking, and here's how I'm prepared for that, right? I have a backup. I know what kind of data you're handling. I know what vendor to call. Um, I, I, and I have all of my ducks in a row to make sure that when you break, that end user doesn't feel it. That system process doesn't feel it. That line of business, they don't even see a hiccup. Because my job is to anticipate you breaking, because I know you will, because you're just a mechanical thing. 
And the most important thing is to train those technicians um, and to really, really get good at taking meticulous notes. And um, one team I led, a, a global organization, actually had um, as part of their bonus structure, annual review and bonus structure, they had a requirement to write notes uh, within their tickets. And um, our ticket count went from many thousands into the tens monthly because they were just really, really good at taking notes. They got good. It's a painful process, but you'll get good at it. Um, and then, of course, establish surveys and measure your successes for all of your services that you're giving your end users. The end. Thank you so much, Karina. That was all wonderful information. Very, very excellent for us all to take with us. So we are unfortunately out of time for questions. However, I didn't see any in the question and answer other than will your slides be made available? And the answer is yes, we are going to make this available. Plus, this session is being recorded and soon after this chapter meeting, you will all be able to get to it through a YouTube link. So um, we will have all this wonderful information at your fingertips for constant review if you're interested in that. Awesome. So thank you, Karina, so much for speaking with us today. Sure, thanks for having me, guys. All right, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to our first sponsor, light, sponsor spotlight presenter, Kodolski. So Tom, I'm gonna go ahead and flip it over to you. All right. And you are now our next presenter, thank you. Show my screen. Does that look good to you? Looks great. Oh, perfect, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Tom Perferal. I am a senior account manager with uh, Kodelsky Security. I've uh, been with Kodelsky a couple of years, um, but I've been in the security business a long time. Uh, those of you out there that might remember the old Sidewinder firewall, that's where I kind of started cutting my teeth on uh, internet security. So that kind of dates me right there. So uh, Kodelsky is kind of an interesting company. Uh, started in 1951. Uh, I, I put a couple little, uh, pictures down the left hand corner here one of this little micro tape recorder it's all james bond stuff um that's kind of where they got they they kind of started then they kind of moved into uh uh securing pay tv so uh those of all of us maybe <laughs> who uh had uh you know uh pirate uh cable boxes uh the day that that didn't work anymore yeah you can thank kadelski um they also are ski data, so uh, people in Minnesota, go, you know, if you go to the Mall of America now and you uh, go to park and it'll tell you how many exact parking spots are in this spot, that's uh, one of the functions of ski data. Um, we are also a uh, international reseller with services and just a huge amount of engineering expertise, uh, over 10,000 customers. We literally spend over 150 million a year on R&D just for our internal uh, services. We also are moving heavily into IoT security, and that's primarily because you know if you look at our legacy, we're we're kind of into small, intelligent uh, machine endpoint um, security to begin with. So it really was a natural fit for us. But if you can think of it with IoT. Um, uh, anything with uh, industrial control systems, things like that, uh, that's, that's when we really kind of differentiate ourselves. Today, I just want to quick talk about um, our security services. And okay, um, really we have, uh, four quadrants. Uh, advisory is basically where we want to partner with you and come up with strategies to minimize your exposure and strengthen your security posture. Um, a lot of the things we're really starting to move into is obviously cloud migration, cloud security in general, you know, what you're doing in AWS, Azure, that kind of stuff, and how we can help um, provide security for those applications. Also, white label, white label, gray label, however you want to 
look at it, but if you are a company that are selling your services to other customers and you want to add, you know, vulnerability scanning services or something like that, we'll work with you and we'll let you, you know, let you sell our services under your um, label. Uh, technology, we have, you know, 40, 50 um, different vendors that we regularly work with and resell, implement. Uh, we also provide 24-7 L1, L2 support to many of these services or uh, uh, vendors, um, which when you do that kind of level of support, you are just naturally going to have excellent engineering services um, as part of that. That's the only way we can provide that kind of support. So uh, really engineering specialists for all those major technology solutions. Uh, managed, managed security services, huge part of uh, what we do. Um, we have complete 24 seven global managed uh, security functionality, specifically using our cyber fusion center, which um, kind of our global intelligence network. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide, in a little more detail. Um, also innovation. Um, we, we've done everything. We've built our own chipsets. We've done, uh, you know, IOT management um, types of uh, engineering functionality. Um, and we use that technology now for securing, you know, uh, chipset security, IOT, uh, again, ICS. Think about the, the, the new growth where what I'm really seeing is security issues with the increased number of remote users. What are you doing with those users? I mean, some of those users need to go straight to AWS, but at the same time, they need to get to the family jewels in the back end. And, you know, how do you secure that? Um, I'll give you another little example, something that we're doing with one customer who they, they have to, uh, they have a business case where they have to still uh, secure embedded XP. Well, this is old technology, but they have to, they have to secure it. And we, we're developing, working with a vendor and our own uh, internal uh, developers to build them a solution at a price point that isn't going to kill them. So it's kind of interesting. One, one other thing too, I'd like to say about this quad, the four quadrants. Kodelsky is very adept at quickly shifting and being very flexible at taking some of these things and customizing them directly for you. A quick example of that would be um, from an advisory point of view, you know, say we come up with something with a SIM, we do, your, we do the security assessment, you decide you want to do the managed security services for that. Um, during our advisory service, we would take the onboarding part that would normally be part of, you know, mandatory part of, man, man, of uh, starting our managed security, and we just roll into the advisory, and it would it would be a, uh, it would it would make the that transition a lot simpler and cheaper. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, our five minutes are up for your sponsor spotlight, but we greatly appreciate you sharing that about Kodelsky. And right, I'm sure you. anyone can reach out to you if they have any further questions from your presentation today. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to go ahead and jump to our second sponsor spotlight today. We're going to switch it over to Chris Sears from CoFence. And he's going to go ahead and share with you his five minutes about CoFence. Are you there, Chris? <laughs> that probably helps whenever you hit both mute buttons. Awesome. <laughs> yep. Good to see everybody there. Give me just a second. I'm just getting the share screen going. Bear with me. There you go. And you should be seeing. Are you guys seeing the screen good? Uh, no, we're seeing your desktop. Oh, okay. That's not good. Let's go to the other screen. Give me a second. All right, for some reason there, it is going to do that. So we're going to switch this up. Give me just a second, guys. Apparently, I forgot GoTo, uh, GoToWebinar does not do multi-screens. Well, anyways, while I get that situated here, give me just a second. Uh, do some introductions here. I completely forgot that GoToWebinar does not like to do multi-screens. <laughs> 
All righty. Well, let's roll with this. Let me see if I can get this thing moved over to the other screen here so we can get that stuff out of the way. All righty. There we go. So, hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Sears, and on the line, I also have my, my rep, uh, Teresa. Uh, we are locals here in the Twin Cities area. We, you know, I've, I've met many of you many, many times over the past. Uh, been a big, big fan of ISSA. And we're going to spend a few minutes here real quick. And if you guys have probably heard of us before, um, we actually are, we were formerly known as uh, Fish Me. And I'm sure you guys have all heard of us. If not, I know a lot of you are actually already customers of us. Obviously, we're really grateful to have that. Where we are today as CoFence is is far more than just Fish Me. We all know Fish Me. Hey, we send you an email, you click on it. Hopefully, you don't click on it, right? And then we get some reporting on that. We're now at a point where we got 25 million people leveraging that tool. And from that, we're able to do a lot of conversations. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these. I want to provide these for you guys later on. But we're now solving the problem of fishing, not just the, hey, testing and a little bit of education and interesting things like that. We're now solving the problem by addressing all of the post-gateway fishing problems. Uh, Karina kind of mentioned it. People click on stuff. We always joke about it. Stop clicking on stuff. Well, we all know the numbers that we find, and actually it was Verizon that documented it, and you guys probably read those reports all the time, 96% uh, of the phishing attacks are via email. We know that. Th that happens all the time. Well, we got a way to be able to help solve that problem. A lot of people will jump in. If you guys remember where I was at about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, AI and machine learning is a pretty powerful tool, incredibly powerful tools, but not as powerful as 25 million end users and their brains and their guts kind of looking at emails as they come in. We leverage those to help solve these problems. So again, I'm not gonna read all these to you. You guys can look at those when we share the slides later on. But here's how we kind of address how to solve this problem. We kind of bring the human part of it back into it and still leverage a lot of automation. Like I said, global network of millions of people. Every single day, clicking that button. Eh, this email looks weird. I've never seen this vendor before. Eh, hit the button. And it's a little fish me button. If you guys haven't seen that yet, you know, we can show you that another time too. Automate what happens after you get the fish. Share the intelligence that we find across the whole organization. Obviously, the training make your your you know folks a lot sharper. Get them up to speed much faster. And of course, we can do some of the managed products. So I'm not going to read all this one either. But there's these five main focus areas. You have Fish Me, which again we already talked about. Same thing, but growing more and more. Really robust education catalog. A lot of opportunity to be able to get your end users very, very sharp. All backgrounds, dozens of languages, you name it. Reporter, that's the button. Now, you guys are probably already using a lot of buttons. You got the junk button from Microsoft. You got a couple of other buttons out there. Not one of them is able to differentiate between a phishing simulation with FishMe and a real-world threat, except for ours. Ours will do that because we sent the phishing solution, you know, the training. And we're able to use that button to also get the information into your SOC or our managed SOC, whichever you want. And that's where triage comes in. Triage does exactly what it's called. It triages it. So let's say you get seven high speeds out there that are going to go ahead and hit that button because they think this email is terrible. Those seven high speeds have that phishing email and it's going to build a cluster. And that cluster is going to have a similar IOC indicator compromise. Your teams, or our teams as managed, can now work on that together. Instead of having 50 different emails from 20 different people, they can now see that it's clustered together and begin to do the triage work. Lots of details there too. Once you determine that's bad, now you gotta solve that problem, right? You can't just leave it out there. You're not just gonna kick a ticket over to messaging and say, hey guys, you might wanna take a look at this someday, even though I know that's how the majority of non-customers operate today, because I've done it. Um, that's where vision comes in. Vision comes in to see who else has that email. Take the indicator compromised, search a massive meta uh, metadata database, find out who else has it, find out if it's done yet. Maybe the, maybe the campaign's still ongoing. Maybe we're gonna be hammered over the next week and a half by these bad actors with this fish campaign. Vision will quarantine and continuously quarantine. And if you're leveraging our intelligence feed, which is, is email specific, it's not just like a generic, uh, you know, Viking or some of the other ones. It's email specific for real world attacks. You incorporate that into vision. Next thing you know, you're automatically quarantining before your end users even touch anything. So in just a few minutes that that I've been, you know, talking at you guys and I appreciate your attention on it. You could actually go from an attack being launched 
to the threat being contained. Our global average right now is eight minutes, uh, whether it's managed or it's with our customers. So that is essentially CoFence in, in, in five and six minutes, and I appreciate you guys' time. Of course, we'll share our contact information, and I just, I can't wait to see you guys this summer. Hopefully, knock on wood, cross fingers, we can get out there and actually have some real after-hour events. So with that, thank you guys very, very much. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Chris, for that presentation and giving us that overview of CoFence. Okay, so we are on to our final presenter. Tony Asher, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, we could do that. All right, Tony, I'm going to go ahead and throw presenter over to you. All right. Right now. All right, let me get this tuned in. Perfect. How does that look? Looks great. All right. Let's talk about four areas to consider when identifying your cybersecurity goals. So first off, this thanks everybody. I'm absolutely honored and humbled to be sharing with you guys. I came up cutting my teeth with a lot of you guys in here and gals and um, just really honored to be sharing this today. And I, I come to you today with just, you know, someone that's, uh, you know, serving along beside you here and um, the first question is, as we're talking about goals, how many of you actually like setting goals? I'd be really interested to see. Put this down in the chat window if you can. Say yes or no, you like or do not like setting goals. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you this industry slide I put together. And I want to give this to you up front just in case you came here today, you wanted to have some resources to set your cybersecurity goals with. I put this together. It's a little busy, but maybe you already know what you want your goals to be. And this is a great resource to justify um, what your goals are going to be. Um, screenshot this. I think this is going to be, Ryan, are you going to be able to share this um, with people after the after the presentation? Yep. So we're recording this and we'll upload the video to our YouTube channel. And, uh, oh, great. Perfect. So either take a screenshot of this and, and use it or uh, Ryan will send this to you later. But I wanted to give this up to you front and center because from here on out, we're going to actually take a step back and look at philosophy before we get into some goal setting. So my goal today is not to be Captain Obvious. <laughs> I want to challenge some of your thinking, uh, open up to some ideas, and actually say some things that might disagree with. So here's the first thing I wanted to, to share. Here's a shocking statement. Amateurs set goals based on the results, and experts set goals based on the origin. Do you agree or disagree with this? Go ahead and put this in the chat window if you agree or disagree. And I'm gonna to try to defend this uh, throughout the rest of this presentation here. Um, you know, one of the greatest gaps that we have is with goals is that we're stepping into the, one of the greatest fears we have as people. We're going into the unknown and we're making a statement about something that we believe is gonna happen a year down the road. And that's really hard and you're putting your name to it. And I don't know about you, but my integrity means a lot to me. So I'm always challenged with how do I create goals? Another challenge that we have is goals are often tied to our performance plan. So what we say today, we're gonna to be measured against in a year. And sometimes our compensation is tied to this or the opportunity to get a promotion or maybe a bonus. And what that causes us to do is create selfish goals in which that we think that we can actually achieve. Um, another area that we run into is in cybersecurity, we're asked to come up with goals, um, but goals actually fit into something much bigger, and that's vision. This is the way that I kind of view it, and I'd be interested in your take, but um, goals are actually kind of far, far way downstream. They start with the vision. And I think it's a really good opportunity if, you know, maybe this is a goal that you, you consider this year, but do you understand the vision of, of the company or the people that you're serving? Because that's really important. And this is, a vision is like, what is the beautiful picture of what the world would look like if your company or business was able to solve a pain or a problem? And 
you know, once you understand that vision, the next step is developing a plan. Like how do we get from where we are to actually fulfilling this beautiful vision? And, um, you know, what are the, the resources and the time? And then finally strategy. And since I'm in a, a virtual room full of cybersecurity professionals, uh, one of the, you know, you guys are the people that really understand what strategy is. Strategy is actually looking to anticipate what challenges and hurdles you're going to have as you try to overcome this. How do you try to execute a plan and try to have these little plans to get around these challenges that you're anticipating? And then finally, we finally get to goals. And goals are like points, points in a game. I mean, if we were to draw an analogy to uh, football, points are like putting some touchdowns on the scoreboard so that we can win a game. That's the strategy. And the plan is to win the season and the vision is to win the Super Bowl. So, you know, we're finally getting down to the goals. And then finally, as an output of that, we'll probably design some projects or initiatives. And then finally, daily or weekly or monthly tasks that we have to, to do to fulfill those projects. So that's kind of where it fits in. What's the goal of a goal? And I think most of us focus on goals, the tangible side of it. You know, it's really good to think about where we're going, where we want to go. Are we on the right path? Trying to measure it. But there's actually this second component. And, you know, like I said, coming up in cybersecurity with a lot of you guys, I really want to encourage you. Your job is, is tough. And one of the things that can actually help you be more successful is enabling the leaders and the people that you're serving with confidence because you're the expert and they wanna know that you're really taking this big responsibility on. So when you come up with goals, you wanna come up with goals that really serve them, serve the business that you're in and kind of get outside of yourself a little bit. Um, I think a really good acid test for this is to say, is this goal the best for the people that I serve? And maybe there's a chance that you can't even accomplish that goal. That would be a goal to really show that you're going above and beyond and doing what's best for the company. So that's something to consider. So now that we got the philosophy out, let's jump into the technical side here. And the first one is technology capabilities. This is where a lot of people spend most of their time thinking about their goals. And I'm a consultant, and so I put this graph up here. I hope you get a kick out of this. I hope it makes sense. The top is where a lot of my clients believe they are. So when I'm invited into a new engagement, they actually think that on a score of zero to five, using something like the NIST, they're at like a four, and they want me to come in and get them to that five. <laughs> but in reality, what we do is we can align them with an industry best framework. So use like NIST or CIS, um, uh, excuse me, CIS or any other kind of framework. And when you align them to that, and then you do some kind of technology security capability assessment on that, it really gives you a true waypoint of actually where you are today. A lot of the people I work with actually come in between one and two, maybe high ones. And when I propose something, it's usually getting them from like a two to a three within 12 months. And that's really hard. That takes a lot of tools and resources. So how do you measure your technology capabilities? Here are some ways that I recommend. SWAT is not something I'm an expert in. I've worked with people that um, I highly respect that use it, but I'm not gonna talk about that too much. The other ones are gap and maturity score or you could do a hybrid approach of either of these. So when you do this, it really shows that you have a clear pulse on where you're at and where your program is at, and it gets everybody to agree. So no one can really argue with that. And it gets you away from this temptation of just doing what's in the news. Maybe your boss or your manager keeps asking you about something that's on their mind and you're tempted to form a goal to satisfy them and get them off your back or maybe you're just you're in one of these groups and there's a current topic that comes up all the time so you think yeah maybe i'll just do what sally and joe are doing another thing i want to recommend here real quick as a sideline is if you can align your program with a framework and then measure it and then figure out where you want to try to get to 
invite someone else in from this group, ISSA. I mean, it's filled with experts. You know, either buy them lunch or take them out to happy hour in a secure location, obviously, and share with them your goals. And then that way, when we talk about confidence, you go and you present your goals to your leadership. You can say, you know, I align our program with an industry best practice. I use that framework to measure our capabilities. I designed these goals, and then I reviewed these goals with a third party, non-biased expert, and that's how I got to these goals. And leaders today really want to know how you got to those goals. So that's a really strong statement that no one's going to argue with. Here's an example of a gap analysis. Uh, this one is NIST. Um, gap analysis is a really great tool to generate questions. They're not here to give us the answers or to help fill us in on what our goal should be, but they're here to, to get us to ask good quality questions and those good quality questions generate really good answers that we can then use to develop what our goals are. Obviously, this chart, this is from an actual client that I worked with. You can see that there's some, some interesting gaps here that justified question. Uh, the explanation here is a lot of companies are, you know, going through transformation, highly cloud dependent. And because of that, the cloud vendors are actually taking care of the recovery capability. And what they're left with is they usually just go out and immature company will buy a lot of products. They'll buy endpoint, firewall, DLP, they'll turn them on and then they'll get all these alerts. But they don't have a lot of process maturity around it. And so they don't have a very good inventory and identification on the front end. And then they don't really know what to do when they're getting alerts and incidents on the back end. So this helped generate some good conversation for goals. The security score, here's the maturity score. Um, I recommend that you copy this. Like I said, Ryan will be sending this out. Go ahead and use this. I really like the maturity score. Uh, a lot of arguments can be made against it, but um, when we use it for leadership presenting, it helps get us outside of ourselves. And what I mean by that is because our goals can be tied to our agendas, and they can be tied to our performance plan. When we get them, it's very tempting to say, let's say you're a, you've are you done a lot of work with vulnerability assessment this year. It's really easy for us to say, well, I'm gonna do more vulnerability work, management work this year, and we're gonna get even better at it. And we don't take the step and say, you know what? Maybe we should improve identity and access management or our PKI solution or application security. And when we use a maturity score and we mark where we are and where our company wants to get to, we're forced to build a bridge, the plan on how to get there before we fill it in with the tactics. And it really aligns with what's the best plan to get there. The other reason I really like this maturity uh, score chart is one of the biggest challenges we have in cybersecurity is the education of our leadership. And I'm gonna get into that in step number three but we want to help educate them how hard our job is. In this chart, it shows that the more mature you get, the exponentially harder it becomes to get a higher and higher score. Like I said, sometimes I'll go into a client, we'll be at like a two, and I'll say, well, I think we can get to a three within 12 months. Well, if they invite me back in year two, we might be able to move it from a three to a 3.5. And sometimes that's really shocking. And I recommend that if you move to a score, that you start giving that expectation early on, because if you're gonna be in your role for the next two to three to four years, uh, your leadership's probably gonna see a, a slowing of the migration of the score, but it doesn't mean that you're not getting more mature and it doesn't mean that you're not advancing further than you were before. Here's a good approach. This is a hybrid approach. Um, so what you see is it starts to mix in the risk level with some of the maturity level. And we're gonna get into risk in step number two here, but this gap analysis will start to compare one security management program against another and see, is there a delta there? Do we understand why that delta is there? Or one capability within a management program to another and against risk levels. So this can be really powerful. So in summary, here are some goals I consider that you you consider, I recommend you consider as part of your technology capabilities. If not, consider aligning with the cybersecurity framework and industry one. 
it's it's really good to be the same these days. You don't want to be different anymore, and it really helps your program. Um, start measuring your capability and maturity. Uh, start recording it, and um, when you record how much you've improved the maturity of the program over the year, you know you can put that on your performance plan. You can show them maybe even you didn't accomplish all the goals, but this is what you did to the overall program, and it really helps offset that. And then it also use it for your personal portfolio. You know you're going to have probably multiple jobs throughout your career. And this is a really strong statement and case study to bring forward with you to show what you've done in the different environments. And even if you're not leading a program, you can still do this on a micro level. Like let's say that you've just been entrusted with doing identity and access management or vulnerability or PKI, whatever it is, start measuring that. And then use a gap assessment. All right, so as we get into number two here, here's the question I have for you. How many of you feel like you have the responsibility of identifying the business risk? Like no one else is identifying the business risk and it's assumed that you and cybersecurity are doing that. If so, type in yes, I'd really like to see that feedback here. Because here's, here's what we have. Number two in identifying your cybersecurity goals should be really assessing how well you're identifying risk. And in the first step, we looked at security capabilities on like this horizontal plane from left to right. And now I wanna dig down and see how well are the security capabilities that you're deploying and supporting actually founded on risk? Because a lot of uh, companies have this very fragile, you know, perspective of what risk is and there's a gap. And when you start to get questioned about why you're deploying a technology or why you're spending so much money, and you're unable to justify that in risk, it makes the program really fragile. And you really wanna to get to this perspective where it's everything you do is solid, like you map it. And so my question when you're thinking about your goals is ask yourself how well does your understanding of risk go within your company? And do you have some opportunities to do something about that? I think we've got a big chasm in cybersecurity right now and it's, you know, to be transparent with you, I don't think it's really fair. I think that, you know, a lot of people in cybersecurity um, are being assumed that you're figuring out what the risk is, that um, the scope of your role is actually probably a lot bigger than what you initially take took on. And, you know, imagine this for a moment, that you came into your job, your role, maybe day one or maybe next week, and there's a three ring binder on your desk. And in that binder, it outlines all the data types that your company deals with and it lists out the the classification like what's restricted what's confidential what's internal what's public and then it maps out where that data is born or where that data is ingested within the company what systems applications servers it traverses what databases it's stored in what security groups can have access to those different levels of data and what third-party vendors you're sharing that with. How much easier would your job be, right? Um, maybe you guys don't struggle with that. I, I see that a lot. And so when you're thinking about risk, here are, my, here are my recommendations on some areas to consider when you're thinking about your goals this year. Consider forming a security committee. This, I probably am one of the last guys that's gonna vote for a committee. But I think if I had to pick one, it'd be this one. And the idea is invite other risk investors within the company in. So this would be security, privacy, compliance, legal or general counsel. I like to invite in uh, facilities management and IT and meet once a month for like a half hour. What you're going to have to do is you're probably going to have to look like an idiot. I mean, it's it's what I have to do because you have to jumpstart the risk conversation. And so you go in there with your, your best guess of what the risk is, and you throw 10 items out, and people like to criticize, and they'll start criticizing, and what that did was serve the company by jumpstarting the conversation, and then just keep that conversation going over the next three, four months until everybody in this committee actually agrees on the different types of risk within the company and the different level of data. It's an extremely powerful thing you can do. Uh, build relationships with business owners. Now you're not, in my experience, can't really have risk conversations with them, 
but you can get to know them and you can get to understand what kind of data they work with, why they work with that data, what they do with it, and infer some levels of risk in it. Um, some companies that I've worked with, cybersecurity is treated like IT. They don't want you to come out of the cubicle and they don't want you to talk to business owners. Um, that's, that's a red flag. As our industry develops, <clears throat> it, that's going to be a challenge for you. Consider developing data classification policy. Um, policies aren't a lot of fun to develop, but if you can just list out the different types of data and get people to sign off that you all see it the same, that's a huge win. Um, and again, uh, start to pull application owners in, and then um, you can also work on your incident event notification to see when people want to be uh, notified. It's another uh, thing to identify risks. All right, so we're getting into step number three here, uh, security marketing. I want to ask you guys this next question. This, How many of you are actually having a risk appetite conversation with your executive leadership? Um, it looks like there's 60 people on this call. Uh, my guess would be less than six, <laughs> less than six people. If there's more than six people, we, we're definitely setting the agenda to the next ISS meet, ISSA meeting around this because I need to learn. I almost got kicked out of the CFO's office recently. Just, you know, my own fault, I think, as an industry, we're trying to figure out how to have these conversations and how to mature this. So number three, consider your security marketing program. I, I think it's really tough. I think one of the, the things that we have going on in cybersecurity is you guys do so much. I mean, you start the day from reading the news and breach notifications to threat intelligence to moving all your initiatives forward to building relationships to you know, making reports and presentations. And the truth is that oftentimes your leaders don't really know what you do you know, whether it's eight hours a day or more, um, you guys are doing a lot. And the way that I think about it is, you know, there's like documentaries and then there's Instagram. And I want to ask you guys, which one are you more like? Because all the cybersecurity people that I know, and I don't like to make generalized statements, um, but you guys are, and gals are real. I mean, there's depth to your life. When you watch a documentary, they go in, they say, well, why do you do what you do? What are the pains and struggles that you have? You know, what is it that you're, you're actually trying to accomplish in life? They get into these, the depth, you know, the depth and the reality, but it takes an hour and a half to two hours. And the sad truth of it, guys and gals, is that our culture kind of wants to consume Instagram. They want to consume something that's bite size, it's quick, it's all show, it's pretty, and um, that's what they're consuming. And so how, if you're more like a documentary, how can we become more like Instagram so that we can make our world shareable with the leaders and the risk investors to start to give them a perspective of what you're doing every day. So consider that. Some ideas are a reporting and metrics program, and, and this is, very limited, I'm just planting some seeds here, and I'm not gonna get into this slide, but here are the different teams that you can usually report um, metrics to, how much time you have, the frequency, and what their goals are, what, what is it that they actually wanna see out of that. And here is um, you know, a bunch of metrics categories. Even if you reported on like 20% of these a month, I think that your leadership would really be shocked and awed of how much you, you do. Um, so something to consider here. So number three, security marketing. Um, consider providing resources. Start to pe let people know what you're doing in your world. I mean, this goes all the way up. Um, recently, I, I moved a program from Gartner scores to the NIST CSF, and I gave the board of directors a 75 page guide on what the NIST uh, CSF is. Almost all of them read it. Um, this is a group of people that wanna feel in control. I mean, they're super smart, they're brilliant, they, they have a heck of a job, but they don't like it when they don't feel equipped. And so if you equip them with resources, then they trust you, and now they're back in control of the conversation. Um, it's a great way to, to build that marketing program. Start risk appetite conversations. Show your leaders that you have a security committee, that you all have unity around risk or you're getting there. Tell them how you're coming up with your risk identification process in case they see it differently. Allow them to speak into that and build a metrics program. All right.
are we doing on time here? It looks pretty good. Okay. Yeah, we're way ahead of time. All right. So this kind of brings us to this number four, people and process. So in step number one, we looked at technology capabilities and we thought of it as this vertical plane going from left to right. And we wanted to stretch those out. And then in step number two, we thought, well, let's dive down into risk and let's see what's supporting these technology capabilities, right? Let's make sure that we understand the business. And then in step number three, we said, well, then let's go up. Let's start marketing this. Let's start letting leadership know of everything that we're doing. Um, and now what we have to do is we kind of have to spread our people and process. If we think of this as like a Kool-Aid spill, we need to make sure that we have enough paper towels to kind of clean up this mess. We've created this monster of a program. And so it's a really good opportunity to put people and process on the back end as you're planning your goals. Um, you know, you're going to, you're going to do more, you're doing more. And can you get approval for the people and process improvements to do all this? And if not, you might want to do a couple, you know, cycles of what your goals look like and make sure that you you had a goal in mind, but you don't think you have the resources to accomplish that and let those leaders make the decision of, of what they feel is appropriate. And for you that lead teams, um, th this can be this can be hard too. you need to find um, ways to tie your people in. There's something I call return on passion. You know, um, some cybersecurity people, when I talk to them, I just see them light up about certain topics. If you have some of those people, let them run with it because you get like, you get a multiple factor of return out of those people. They just love what they do. And then there's return on talent. Like some people are, they, they don't get excited about what they do, but they have a talent for what they do. And then try to have them, you know, use that as, as part of your plan too. So as we look at this like wholly in perspective, there's a lot of process development opportunities. I see like that gap analysis I shared, um, asset management. You guys, I don't see anybody doing it well. I'm sorry to say, but no one's got it nailed down. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there to develop process around that. Um, incident management, um, I'm specifically talking about cybersecurity incident management response, your third party programs how and when you perform a risk assessment. All these things can improve your efficiencies um, of how well uh, you're doing it, how quick you're doing it, and how well you're communicating. Professional development, I mean, really around, um, you know, do you have a mentor? I mean, we've got a lot of talented people in this group. Um, I've had a lot of mentors, a lot of informal, um, you know, uh, Renee's mentored me. I've uh, man, I used to chase her around the building and ask her to explain Nginx and API gateways to me. Uh, you know, uh, she never rolled her eyes to me. You know, Ryan's mentored me on several topics. Um, you know, see what you need to grow this year and see if you can find someone to mentor. What kind of education and training? Be a part of groups like this. Congrats, you guys! Like, pat on the back. This is fantastic. See if you can pivot and find a group that's specific to the industry of the business that you're serving. So whether that's retail or banking or hospitality, um, there's some really interesting industry groups and it really shows that confidence level. Again, I'm, I, I want you guys to be seen as the expert leaders. I was recently told by someone I met with, um, he, he said to me, he goes, I don't hire consultants to stop at my level of thinking. I don't hire consultants to stop at my level of thinking. And I was I was shocked by that and I was encouraged by that. And I wanna encourage you guys too that, you know, don't stop at the level of thinking of your leaders. They brought you in, they trust you. It, you know, you bring your level of thinking to that program. And I, I want you to garner that respect and be seen not only as a cybersecurity expert, but also a risk advisor. And something happens when you move out of this this IT pigeonhole security role to becoming a real, someone who understands the business and who has a pulse on risk, they're gonna come to you and respect you in a whole nother way. And it's it's an amazing feeling. Um, if you're developing a team, um, it might be a great opportunity to look at those roles and responsibilities that you have today um, and break them down, assign them to somebody, let them own it. You know, Look at some of those things that we, let them do the metrics collection. Uh, and finally, one of the first things in member development, um, you know, what I like to do is team building. Uh, once a month, go grab, 
you know, some coffee. I know we're living in some weird times right now, but we'd play a board game and just get to know the team members. And I was always shocked on, on how valuable that was. So here are some goals to consider when you're looking at people and process. Um, consider what process developments can be done this year to really improve your program. Dive into those peer groups, industry groups. Um, you know, don't give them up. I know when you get busy, it's going to be tempted to cut corners and not show up. That's just going to degrade the respect that you have from your leaders when they see that, hey, you're in the, one of the leading, you know, cybersecurity groups in Minnesota. Uh, respect, you know. Um, continue to push in the training, team building, get those roles um, built out, build out those individual management programs with under the cybersecurity umbrella and entrust people uh, to do it or, or even mentor them, you know. All right, so in summary, we kind of took this big journey and we started with philosophy. Um, consider where, where goals are. Really consider if you understand the vision of the, the company that you're serving, the people that you're serving. Um, I wouldn't write this down, but I'd, I'd consider if you believe in it. You know, it's a really good opportunity. You guys, life short. Um, some people that I know got laid off through this pandemic, and I was so encouraged by them stopping and going, you know what? What do I believe in? What kind of company do I want to support? And they're on fire. You know, when you get lined up with what your passion and purpose is with a company philosophy, um, it's, it's really amazing. Technology, align your program with the cybersecurity framework. It can still be custom, but it's still aligned and it, it's very powerful. Start measuring that program. Uh, use a gap analysis from that framework to ask good questions, to identify goals and score it. Number two, uh, understand risk. Consider how well your risk understanding is. Identify those risks. Unify across a committee. Start to build relationships with business owners. And then finally, classify data if you can get that far. Marketing. Build a marketing program. More people have to know about the great things you guys are doing. Don't be shy. I think most of us are introverts and we're, we're scared to brag. Um, do it. Do it not for yourself, but do it for your leaders to give them more confidence about what you're doing. Equip them, give them metrics, give them a show, give them the Instagram, right? And then finally, consider those resources um, that you're going to need to make this all come together and give them a seat at the table to say, yeah, I want more of this or no, this is too much and let them limit what you're doing. Um, be bold um, and don't stop at their level of thinking. And finally, entrust people to the roles that you're giving within your program. Start to, to delegate that. That's me. That's my smiley mug. If uh, you need anything, um, you know, reach out to me, connect with me. I love connecting with other cybersecurity folks, um, an amazing community. So with that, we can open it up and see if there's, there's any questions at all. So Tony, thank you so much. There is one question in the Q&A. I don't know if you can see it. I can't. My chat is unfortunately limited to just the, um, the, the speakers. Okay. So here's the question. How do you get your client to articulate to what maturity that they can realistically aspire, i.e. what's their risk appetite? Not all controls should be viewed as having the same priority. For some areas, a three might be good enough from the RM perspective. In yep. other areas, a four may be what you need to get to in order to be comfortable with the risk. Whoever asked that question is uh, had the pain and they know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the quality of the question generates the quality of the answer. And I think, you know, I think it'd be a great panelist discussion at an ISSA meeting to talk about this. Um, but that's why we want to start having risk appetites. We, we are enablers. Our job in cybersecurity, we didn't know it, but it's to find the risk and then tell them what we can do about it. Risk management. Are we going to mitigate it, remediate it, accept it, or transfer it? And at some point, as we've been doing over the decade or more of cybersecurity, we've been marching these programs forward. And they're getting to the point where some of them, are, they need to tell us when to stop because uh, all of history, they just said, we, are we secure yet? Are we secure? Are we good? And we don't want to answer that. And um, so we have to balance that and we have to initiate these risk appetite conversations. I am not doing it well. 
I'm not, I have a lot to learn and I'm going to other people and asking how they're doing it. Uh, one of the ways I have done it is start to uh, spear off the program. So you'll say, well, for the most part, based on your peers, based on what I know or what I understand, maybe a three, I wouldn't say a three, I'd kind of say like a 3.5 might be good enough, but you've got this one business unit over here and they've got a pocket of data and they don't want to get rid of it. And I would say for that risk level, let's move that up above a four. So you start building different risk profiles within the business, and that's probably the best answer I can give, to be honest. Great question. So David, did that answer your question? I'm hoping he was still on for that. Sure. Renee, you have a good pulse on that. What would you say? I honestly have seen it go a couple different ways. Um, one way I've seen in my career for these risk appetite conversations has been leading into more of how you ask the right leading questions to help kind of back people into this because it can be a very uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. And it's not well grounded in understanding of the language of what does risk appetite actually mean. So right. sometimes when we use security specific wording, it ends up turning people off. And yep. I feel like they kind of tune us out sometimes. Yep. And just to add to that, I find the people that um, IT is reporting to is CFOs. CFOs are, are, are brilliant. Uh, but their numbers very formula and this we don't have a formula over risk appetite it's kind of a philosophical conversation and so those two don't align very well agreed and i think that's why you have to do your due diligence to understand the people you're talking to their background and how they view things because that's yeah. a really critical element of having these types of conversations yeah yeah good point I think that probably that group of people, uh, you know, is dealing dealing with financial risk. Maybe you know we can learn more about how they're approaching that and and pivot off that and join their conversation instead of initiating our own. So, great question. Are there any other ones? I don't see any others. Does anyone else have any questions for Tony on his presentation today or anything he's experienced? I take silence as a no. <laughs> Once again, we are recording this presentation and there will be a link through our YouTube site. So we'll be sending that out shortly after today's chapter meeting. But thank you so much, Tony. I think hey, we're gonna you. turn it back over to Ryan for closing comments. Perfect, thanks everyone. Yeah, I, uh, I actually don't have any other comments other than thanking everyone for attending. And um, like I said, look for the uh, the March web webinar is available and um, uh, to go sign up for. And other than that, we'll see you soon. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody.